The benefit of seeing can come only if you pause a while, extricate yourself from the maddening mob of quick impressions ceaselessly battering our lives, and look thoughtfully at a quiet image. Dorothea Lange was a Great Depression-era documentary photographer, and this quote has inspired many of my images, such as this one of Elle Anderson. Elle is five years old, and she is playing outside her home on a ranch in the Centennial Valley of southwest Montana. Elle has grown up in the freedom of wide open spaces. When I made this photograph in 2015, I did not realize how symbolic it would be in my life and my work. I see myself in this photograph. When I was a little older than Elle, I took a trip with my father to the prior mountains of Montana. My father was a staff photographer for National Geographic magazine, and at age 10, I joined him on his last assignment for the magazine as a photographer. We left our home in Virginia and made it to Sheridan, Wyoming in two days. My father and his assistant needed to camp in the prior mountains to photograph wild horses. Now, the wild horses were particularly challenging to get close enough to to photograph. One day, my father had set up his camera on a tripod out in the field and told me to just hang out and watch the horses as they grazed quite a distance away. He went off to do something else. I walked up to his camera, and I started looking at the horses through the viewfinder. I don't remember how long I was there, but by the time my father came back to check on me, I was surrounded by wild horses. I had no idea at the time that this moment in my childhood would have such an impact on my life. It's the first time I remember looking through a camera and feeling in touch with something outside of myself in an environment that I loved. Ten years later, in my early 20s, I found myself working as a horse wrangler on a ranch in the Centennial Valley, the same ranch where I later made that photograph of Elle. I had enrolled in journalism school at the University of Montana, thinking maybe I wanted to be a writer. It didn't take long for me to decide that news reporting was not exactly my calling, but photojournalism unlocked something that allowed me to communicate with the world. And documentary photography, in particular, was a way I could explore the things I love and care about in a way that I could not express through words. What I knew of photojournalism was what I saw on the pages of National Geographic magazine throughout my childhood. What I knew was how I watched my father work, living for months on end in a place to work on one story. Photography had shaped my life, but I did not truly discover this until I picked up a camera for the first time with the intention of telling a story. As I lived in the Centennial Valley, I photographed moments of my life there. Those photographs will always be meaningful records of my life and my story. Living in this ranching community and photographing my life here has also been the foundation for how I learned to see, the kind of quiet seeing that Dorothea Lange was talking about. I began to find my own sense of place within myself in the freedom of that wide-open Montana landscape and my camera was a way to express my relationship to place. I began to see how people can shape landscapes, and landscapes can shape people. I wanted to get closer to the issues I was learning about in the Centennial Valley, so I went to Tom Minor Basin, a ranching community on the northern border of Yellowstone National Park, where people live with grizzly bears and wolves. Tom Miner has one of the most densely populated grizzly bear habitats in the West. I followed my friend Hilary Anderson to her husband's multi-generational family ranch, where she was experimenting with solutions that could help people ranch alongside these carnivores. In Tom Miner, I was welcomed into the lives of a family who does not view themselves as the center of their environment but as one small piece of a much larger environment within a wild ecosystem. What I found in Tom Minor was a story 
much more lyrical and nuanced than human wildlife conflict. What I was actually seeing and documenting was an intimate relationship between people and place. I learned that the roots of this land ethic go back generations to 1955, when Virginia Anderson and her husband Andy settled in Tom Minor Basin. Virginia felt such a strong connection to this place that she stayed there for the rest of her life and raised her children there. Now her great-grandchildren are being raised there. I had the honor of knowing Virginia the last few years of her life and seeing her just days before she passed away, surrounded by family on the ranch. As I continued to photograph, I received funding for my work in Tom Minor, which allowed me the time to live there for a full summer with the family. Through this work, I've met my fiancé, Daniel Anderson, who is Elle's uncle. So now I am part of their family. This project has evolved in ways I never could have imagined. It has become a very personal reflection of my relationship to this family and this place. This is what I learn through the process of photographing, being present and listening, both with and without my camera. It allows me to enter the children's worlds, a world where imagination and curiosity are endless. Our mainstream culture in America can have an extractive nature to it. For example, in Tom Minor Basin, a growing number of tourists come to look for grizzly bears. Their presence is having a profound impact on the community of both humans and wildlife. Even well-intentioned, curious people can have an impact they're not aware of, especially as their numbers increase. Photojournalism can be the same way. We often arrive with the stories we want to tell. We are trained to come in, get what we need for our stories, and then move on to the next assignment. This is often called parachute journalism, and it is why some people have felt marginalized and used by the media. When we do this, we risk playing into the extractive and oftentimes oppressive parts of our culture. How can we even begin to understand something until we have spent time? If we are asking to be let into people's lives, we should be willing to put our agendas aside for a moment and listen, maybe even let people into our own lives. As Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh said, the most precious gift we can offer others is our presence. My camera has awakened me to the power of presence. My camera is my bridge to the outside world. It is a pathway to experience cherished aspects of life beyond what you see in my images. It teaches me to listen deeply to the voices of others. It gives me access to my own voice. It awakens my creativity. Being present allows me to see the essence of who someone is and with my camera, I can reflect it back to them. Living in the West has challenged me to contemplate the impact that I have and we have on the places we call home. This curiosity leads me to some of the richest cultures in the world and takes me across borders. For the past few years, I have been working on a story that I started in graduate school, about the Blackfoot people in Montana and Canada and their relationship with bison, the animal their ancestors evolved with for thousands of years. The bison is a potent symbol of Plains Indian culture, culture that is so deeply rooted in place that the English language does not have words to describe it. Bison and native people are intertwined, and it is well known that the annihilation of bison in the 19th century was integral to the systematic removal of native people from their homelands and ways of life. The mass slaughtering of buffalo depleted their food source, their culture, and their identity, 
It was a forced separation from the essence of who they are. The impact is still being felt today. I have met people who are trying to straddle two worlds, finding their place in the modern world and the culture of their ancestors, which is inextricably tied to nature. In my travels, I visited with a bison rancher in the Kainai First Nation in Alberta, Canada. This is Dan Fox. Dan said to me, "The only way the native people are going to start gaining ground again, their ways of life, is when the bison come back." So, as people like Dan work to return bison to parts of their historic range, it is a remarkable step towards healing for his people and the land. I wanted to learn what this relationship between the Blackfoot people and bison looks like today. A big part of it has to do with the ritual of hunting, butchering, and using every part of the animal. The bison are also a way to teach the next generation about these timeless rituals that are grounded in respect and gratitude for life. Over the course of my time with Dan's family, his brother Charlie, who is an elder, performed a ceremony to give me a Blackfoot name. The name he gave me is Asinaki, or Picture Woman, and he told me it comes from writing on stone, which is a sacred place in Alberta where ancient pictographs depict Blackfoot life. Their family has allowed me in to photograph these rituals. Here, Amanda is draining the blood from a bison, the first step in butchering the animal that will feed and nourish their people. In a blending of two worlds, Amanda then turns to document herself in the midst of this ritual with her cell phone. In a blending of ranching and native culture, Shane Bird Rattler rides a bronc at North American Indian Days in Browning, Montana. Working on this story, I have realized that one of the greatest social injustices is disconnecting people from their native culture and their homeland. And promoting the myth that humans can eternally dominate nature. There is an intimacy between people and the natural world. There is great pleasure in it when you pursue it, and see it, and feel it. We often talk about giving people a voice, but what about also giving a voice to the landscape and all that's in it? The last story I will share with you. Is about an experience that very quickly forced me into presence. At first light on a chilly September morning in Tom Minor Basin, I was going to set up a camera trap, and I came across a mother grizzly bear, much like the one you see in this photograph. A series of events occurred which forced me to use bear spray. I stood six feet from her. And through a cloud of spray, our eyes met for a brief moment before she took off in the other direction with her cubs. In her eyes, I saw fear, which was perhaps a reflection of my own fear. But since this experience, I have deciphered a profound message from her that will stick with me for the rest of my life. We live in a world of boundaries. We, as humans, usually decide the terms of these boundaries. And we cross them when we want to. That grizzly bear, America's largest carnivore, woke me up to the fact that this place is not, and cannot be, ruled by our terms only. The experiences I have had with my camera, the extraordinary and the difficult, have taught me something about life. And a few are as touching as the stories I've shared with you today. Photographs can transcend boundaries; they can evoke visceral feelings. The act of photographing, and the photograph itself, can be a small step in helping us understand each other better, in both the human and the non-human world. Each photograph you see here today is a labor of love. Thank you.